to, to tackle them. So I'd like to share a bit about myself as your moderator and relate my experiences to the importance of today's conversation. Uh, so my name is Clementine Jarrett, as you know, and I am a child and youth rights advocate uh, with a primary interest in subject engaged system reform. And I do this uh, because I was raised by a system myself. I grew up in foster care uh, where I've been for about half of my life. And so once I got started at Carleton University in 2021 uh, in majoring in human rights and social justice, I strengthened my intellectual capacity to interpret the hardship that I faced in foster care, but I didn't really have anywhere to apply myself until I met Kate and Terrence and became involved with the CCRC. And in staying involved, I really do mean it. <laughs> um, I started out as a focus group participant of our recently concluded youth engagement project on the UN Review of Children's Rights in Canada. Uh, but eventually I went on to analyze and code the project's data as a part of my summer internship after which I uh, facilitated sessions between youth representatives and government officials. And finally, I co-authored the project's final report. I, I wouldn't have been able to do any of this without being given the chance to be heard. So I'm definitely eternally grateful for the support that mm -hmm. I've had. Um, I further engage with my community uh, as a youth policymaker with the Ontario uh, sorry, the Ontario Council of International Cooperation, and I'm also a part of People for Education's Youth Network. So while all of this is great, <laughs> I always like to say that my life is more of an exception to the rules. Compared to other youth in care, I am privileged in relation to my education and support from organizations like the CCRC. Most of us don't get these types of opportunities because we are significantly stunted uh, by the perpetual disregard of our rights in care. Um, and so, you know, I, I want to share an example that most of you might be aware of. Uh, but when I was about 16 years old, I believe, um, I remember not just the day, but the hour that I was told um, that the Ontario Child Advocate was being discontinued. And as a Crown Ward with very little support, I will never forget uh, the fear and the dread that I felt. Um, and I just can't help but wonder how that decision would have changed if Ontario had adequately considered all of the ways in which it would impact the rights of children. And so to circle back to why we're here today, Youth in care are one of the many demographics that would particularly benefit from Justice Canada's uh, child rights impact assessment tools. And, you know, I think that's why it's so important to gather here today and to learn about this tool, uh, because the uses are endless. So now I'll just switch gears and briefly introduce the people that you actually registered to listen to. <laughs> uh, so first I'll introduce Kate Butler, who is the chair and president of the Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children. Second, I'll introduce Terence Hamilton, who is a policy and advocacy specialist at UNICEF Canada and a director at the Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children. And lastly, Jolan Lausan and Cassandre Lavo are both experienced legal counsel at Justice Canada, who will be speaking about the tool that we've made available today. And uh, without further ado, let's uh, get to this webinar's true beginning. Uh, Kate, you can kick it off. Thank you so much, Clementine. And thank you everyone for joining us today. I'm really looking forward to this session. Uh, I just want to say that we're so thrilled that, to be co-hosting this webinar with UNICEF uh, and working with Justice Canada. The child rights impact assessment tool that has been developed uh, is really going to be useful for so many children and is a really key part of realizing children's rights. Next slide, please. So uh, as you, as many of you are aware, the Canadian Coalition for the Rights of Children is a civil society organization that's been around for over 30 years. 
we work on sort of building this network of children's rights advocates and organizations and academics and students and people who are passionate about children children's rights in Canada. We provide resources, we share policy analysis, and importantly, we work on the monitoring and reporting of children's rights under the Convention on the Rights of the Child, sort of from the civil society perspective. So we've been very involved in coordinating civil society reports uh, and helping civil society organizations participate in the process. Next slide, please. I'll just briefly talk about sort of the most recent review, which is kind of for us, one of the, the reasons that we're here today. And so we were reviewed in October, 2012. Uh, and then there's been a number of delays, most of them COVID related. The government responded, uh, did a report in March 2019, uh, and the alternative reports went in March 2020, just before COVID. The UN list of issues was November 2021. Canada appeared virtually in May 2022, and the concluding observations came out about a year later. And we've been following up uh, on the recommendations, as have government um, ministries and officials. Next slide, please. I just wanted to highlight three different places in the concluding observations where we see child rights impact assessments mentioned. I know that Jolene and Cassandra will talk more later about sort of exactly what they uh, what they are using with their tool as a child rights impact assessment, but I just wanted to point out why they're so important in the concluding observations. So here's three different places. So first um, is uh, it mentions when we're taking a ch children's rights based approach in the elaboration of the budget, there should be a tracking system for these impact assessments to see um, how investments in any sector may serve the best interests of the child. We also note it in um, international assistance and cooperation programs, child rights impact assessments are mentioned. And finally, sort of more, more relevant perhaps to the conversation today is that there should be um, you know, compulsory uh, impact assessment processes for all laws and policies relevant to children on the realization of the child's best interests. So uh, that's kind of why we're interested. And then um, in terms of our recommendation and the recommendation of many others in civil society is, is to commit to using a CREA for all federal legislation and programs that affect children, encourages provinces and territories to use them, especially for areas of joint jurisdiction. Next slide, please. From the civil society perspective, we continue to work on that. One of the things we're so pleased about is that this tool is available, this course is available, uh, and the real leadership shown by Justice Canada. So we're excited to see where this goes, uh, and we look forward to hearing more from Justice Canada. On that note, I will pass it over to uh, Terence from UNICEF Canada and the CCRC. Thank you, Kate. Uh, couldn't have said it better myself. UNICEF Canada is ex extremely excited about this development, the introduction of uh, quote unquote official CREA tool and training program for not just public servants in the federal government, but also public servants across all levels of government, as well as uh, students, civil society advocates, et cetera. Uh, I, I, we're very, very happy that this tool is being made uh, available across the country publicly and, and in fact internationally we have no doubt that um other people in other countries will be looking to Canada's leadership in this area and, and drawing on the resources that have been made available and that's something that certainly uh UNICEF Canada has uh mentioned to some of our colleagues internationally so very excited about this development it's something that UNICEF Canada has advocated for for a very long time uh, as Kate mentioned, uh, the use of CREA is an international best practice in terms of implementation of the UNCRC. And uh, so we have been involved uh, internationally and domestically here in Canada uh, on CREA best practice, including uh, the use at various levels of governments, the use by civil society, uh, training for folks in various levels of public service, um, my colleague Lisa Wolf, who's on the call today, has been uh, tireless in her advocacy, and so uh, I think she only asked me to speak today because she's uh, too excited about this to, to do so herself. Um, I'm not going to get into too much about what a child rights impact assessment is because our colleagues from Justice Canada will cover that, but our message, uh, our primary message on 
child rights impact assessments, including now moving forward, uh, perhaps more than ever, is that there is no child neutral policy. And so the impact of every policy and proposed piece of legislation on children and their rights needs to be part of a proactive assessment process in order to ensure that the rights of children are promoted and protected across all levels of government and all government, um, all government business. The thing about children is that, um, you know, Canada is a representative democracy in which we have a significant segment of the population, approximately 20%, uh, unable to vote, um, by which I mean, of course, uh, children and young people under the age of, of 18. And so there is a duty under both the Convention on the Rights of the Child, but also in the spirit of democracy to ensure that government is paying special consideration to the unique needs of children in their in their process in their policy and legislative processes. Uh, in particular, uh, there are quite quite a few decisions that are made in which children are uh, overlooked. The interests of children are overlooked or subordinated to other interests. And in particular, we see that happening in areas of policy that are not specific to children. So areas of policy where we're talking about Canada writ large, uh, the interests and the rights of children can get lost in those discussions. And that's one of the primary benefits of the CREA process that we are advocating for, uh, continue to advocate for. So like I, like I say, the, the use of a CREA can make children visible and therefore make them a higher priority in policy and decision-making processes. It also um, protects the integrity of proposed legislation or policies, uh, both against later claims of, of charter or convention breaches, of course, but also in terms of making policy that is uh, cost-effective, targeted, um, evidence-informed, involving young people in particular in the CREA process and having a direct line of engagement into a proactive assessment process is a critical component of CREA that just makes sense. And so when you look at some of the evidence internationally, which I'm going to talk about briefly about how, how folks in other jurisdictions have been adopting CREA, you see quotes like this one from New Zealand where uh, it just... The, the use of CREA just makes sense. It makes so much sense. And once once um, governments ad adopt this process, they kind of wonder how they ever conducted business without it. <clears throat> the other thing about this process that is particularly useful to highlight is that it helps children, but it also helps governments. So it makes policy and legislative processes smoother, more effective, um, and, and more impactful in the long run. So just quickly, <laughs> the use of CREA internationally has been growing significantly in recent years. We have a list, in, a, a now incomplete list of jurisdictions up on the screen there uh, where you can find some form of CREA process currently underway. Um, that includes jurisdictions in Canada, including the province of New Brunswick, and now, of course, at the federal level, where this um, where this CREA process is being implemented, not mandatory uh, at the federal level yet. That's our next uh, that's our next advocacy objective. But um, not only will this tool that Justice Canada introduced encourage uptake at the federal level, but we hope it will also encourage uh, uptake at other levels of government who will have access to this uh, fantastic template and training program for their public servants in adopting CREA. So as I mentioned early on, there is no child neutral policy. And, and what we mean by that is, um, and, and, and another reason why our advocacy to have CREA applied across all areas of policy and legislation is the next step, is because when you make a child rights impact assessment sort of a, a voluntary process, we see uh, we see the tool being picked up and applied to areas of policy that are obviously impacting children. So things like uh, child welfare legislation or or uh, school board policies, those things, those th that's great. 
but those things, the children's rights should be inherent to those decision-making processes. Where Again, where we really see CREA shine is when it is applied to policies and legislation that on their surface do not necessarily uh, directly or, or uniquely, or it, not, not uniquely, uniquely, yes, but uh, uh, impact children specifically or, or name children specifically. So you see a list of some of the things like transportation routes, uh, the implementation of pandemic emergency measures, things where the entire society is talking about this policy and the CREA allows for a pause and reflect to ensure that children's rights are being properly considered as those decision making processes unfold. So how can this best be done? Again, across the world, we see uh, a variety of implementation pro approaches. The best practice is, of course, to have CREA being a mandatory process uh, uh, as part of the uh, policy decision making. But there's different ways of implementing it. Different jurisdictions have uh, housed uh, the CREA process in different areas. Sometimes it sits with an independent child advocate. Sometimes it is internal to the government. Sometimes the CREAs are made public after they're conducted. Sometimes they're kept confidential as cabinet advice. So there's a variety of implementation approaches. Uh, UNICEF Canada has been working on a, a working document to support uh, government officials and, and in particular elected officials who are interested in moving CREA towards uh, uh, implementation in their province or territory, for example. And uh, it's not publicly available, but we are always available to answer questions in terms of how CREA can be implemented in Canadian jurisdictions. Just really quickly, in terms of the ingredients for success, you see uh, internationally, these are the things that we see lead to the best CREA process. Um, the template and tool that we're talking about today checks the box very well, in our opinion, for that third component. Uh, we don't have the mandate yet for uh, requirements for CREA across all levels of government, but that's what we're working towards. And then the last point that really highlights the need for cross-sectoral coordination, Justice Canada has been incredibly collaborative with the CCRC and UNICEF Canada and allowing us to feed into the process and the development of the CREA tool. It's been uh, exemplary and we hope that um, we hope that we can continue to work closely together because that sort of cross-sectoral, cross-government collaboration is where uh, this tool will be given the uh, its best opportunity for success. Just a couple final um, points of things that we see internationally that it, uh, lead to CREA success. Um, basing your analysis on the Convention on the Rights of the Child uh, is, a, is a strong framework for considering potential impacts. Um, again, the the application of the CREA in it, in policy areas where children are not the immediate or direct focus is another best practice internationally. And then finally, the, the idea of CREA as a step towards implementation, full implementation of the convention in a country like Canada, it's part of uh, a range of tools that are available to governments to uh, implement the convention and to ensure that children's rights are are uh, respected. And the more mechan mechanisms like CREA that we have in place, the more they amplify each other. So again, we're very excited by the developments of uh, this past year. A lot of work went into this tool and we're very thankful to be able to host this webinar and to um, provide a space for our colleagues at Justice Canada to talk a little bit about the fantastic tool that they've developed. So. Uh, Jolene and Cassandra, over to you. Thank you, Terrence. Um, oh, hello. Um, as mentioned, I'm Cassandra Lavo, and uh, I'm counsel at the Family Law and Youth Justice Policy Section at the Department of Justice Canada. And uh, I'm here with my colleague, uh, Jolene Lozon, who is also counsel at the Human Rights Law Section at the, of the Department of Justice. 
Uh, can I please have the next slide, the overview? Thank you. Now, today we will be presenting Canada's online course and tool on the Child Rights Impact Assessment. I will first provide some context and go over the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and Canada's obligations, Canada's appearances before the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child and recommendations, and how Justice Canada developed the CREA tool and course. And then Jelana will provide an overview of the CREA tool, an overview of the CREA course. She will also discuss the interaction with the GBA Plus and the future of CREA. And we will also have a question period. Uh, next slide, please. Starting with the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child. Now, the convention was adopted by the UN General Assembly in 1989, and Canada was actively involved in the drafting and was one of the first countries to ratify this treaty in 1991. This convention affirms and elaborates on the special and inalienable rights of children and requires states parties to consider the best interests of the child in all actions concerning children. Now, this convention is the most ratified international treaty in the history of the United Nations. It has been ratified by uh, 196 countries and it has uh, four guiding principles, non-discrimination, best interests of the child, the right to life, survival and development, respect for the views of the child. And some of the rights protected under the Convention on the Rights of the Child include the right to a name, nationality and family relations, the right of the child to freely express their views, the right of the child to the enjoyment of the highest attainable standard of health, special protection measures for children, including protect, protection from violence and abuse, the right to education, and the right to participate in cultural life. Next slide, please. Now, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Child and Canada's Obligations the implementation of a treaty starts when it is ratified, but it is an ongoing process. And the Convention on the Rights of the Child is no different. And even though it was ratified by Canada in 1991, the implementation process continues. In accordance with Article 4 of the Convention on the Rights of the Child, states parties shall undertake all appropriate legislative, administrative and other measures for the implementation of the rights recognized in the present uh, convention. And with regards to economic, social and cultural rights, state parties must undertake these measures to the maximum extent of their available resources. It is important to note that international human rights treaties do not automatically become part of Canadian domestic law. Um, they are not generally directly incorporated into law, meaning that they cannot be the basis of a claim in Canadian courts. However, they do have an effect on domestic law, and this is because there is a presumption in Canadian law that domestic laws conform with Canada's binding international obligations. And as such, courts may consider international human rights treaties to interpret domestic laws, including the Canadian Charter of Rights and Freedoms. To determine the scope and content of treaty rights, courts may also consider the treaty's drafting history and the general comments of treaty bodies, treaties bodies. Now, while legislation in Canada generally does not specifically adopt or incorporate the convention itself, a number of pieces of legislation serve to protect and ensure the rights recognized in the convention. Some of these laws refer to the convention on the rights of the child principles, namely the best interests of the child, non-discrimination, and the views of the child. Some statutes also make explicit reference to the convention in their preambles. An example is a Youth Criminal Justice Act. It recognizes in its preamble that Canada is a party to the Convention on the Rights of the Child. And this explicit recognition provides an indication of Parliament's intention in passing the legislation and means that the act must be interpreted in a way that conforms with the obligations set out in the convention. 
Another example of legislation that serves to protect the rights recognized in the convention is the Divorce Act. It sets out a list of specific factors that a court must consider when deciding what would be in a child's best interests when making a parenting order. Along with the primary considerations of the child's physical, emotional, and psychological safety and well being, other factors include the nature and strength of the child's relationships with parents, grandparents, and other important people in their life, the cultural, uh, the child's linguistic, cultural, and spiritual heritage and upbringing, including indigenous heritage, and the child's views and preferences, uh, giving due weight to the child's age and maturity. Now, the Committee on the Rights of the Child's General Comment Number 5 provides guidance to states' parties on general measures of implementation and recommends the use of CREA. Next slide, please. Appearances before the Committee and Recommendations. On May 17th and 18th, 2022, a delegation of Canadian officials appeared before the United Nations Committee on the Rights of the Child for an examination of Canada's implementation of the Convention on the Rights of the Child. So the Committee on the Rights of the Child released its concluding observations for Canada on June 9th, 2022. And uh, some of these included to utilize a child rights approach in the elaboration of the state budget, by implementing a tracking system for the allocation and the use of resources for children throughout the budget, the state party should also use this tracking system for impact assessments on how investments in any sector may serve the best interests of the child, to require companies to undertake assessments, consultations, and full public disclosure of the environmental, health-related, and other children's rights impacts of their business activities and their plans to address such impacts, and to establish compulsory processes for ex ante and ex post impact assessments of all laws and policies relevant to children on the realization of the right of the child to have his or her best interests taken as a primary consideration. While non-binding, the Committee on the Rights of the Child expects Canada to seriously consider its, its recommendations and Canada's practice, both at the federal level and together with provinces and territories, is to carefully consider the committee's recommendations and to identify ways to implement them as appropriate. Next slide, please. How Justice Canada developed the CREA tool in course. Now, the launch of the CREA tool responds to long-standing calls from domestic stakeholders, as well as from the international arena for governments to use CREAs in their policy development process. And since 2012, the Committee on the Rights of the Child has recommended the creation of a compulsory child rights impact assessment tool. As a result, about three years ago, Justice Canada employees from the Human Rights Law Section and the Family Law and Youth Justice Policy Section took the initiative to start work towards the tool. An advisory group comprised of key stakeholders, including civil society stakeholders and organizations active on children's rights, was created to provide feedback on the content of the Child's Rights Impact Assessment Tool and course. And other government departments were also consulted on the CREA tool. And in July 2023, Justice Canada launched the Child's Rights Impact Assessment Tool and accompanying online course. The purpose of the CREA tool is to assist officials in considering the impacts of a new law, policy, program, or other initiatives on children. And while primarily aimed at federal officials, this tool can equally be used by other governmental or non-governmental organizations, or by others who want to assess the impact of an initiative on children's rights. A vast array of federal laws, programs, policies, and initiatives have impacts on children, even those that are not specifically directed at them. Adopting the use of CREAs within government has the potential to significantly improve outcomes for children by ensuring government measures fully consider children's rights and interests. 
Um, next slide, please. And I will take this opportunity to hand it over to my colleague, uh, Jolane, who will present the Korea tool and course. Merci beaucoup, Cassandre. Bonjour tout le monde. Thanks for uh, being here today with us. Um, so I will now talk about the tool itself and the, and the, the course. So um, first of all, why uh, a Korea? Why, why did we need to develop a tool and a course? I think that Terence explained very well why it was necessary. Um, but we already have a gender-based analysis plus that is mandatory when we develop initiatives at the federal government. And it sometimes includes children. It's actually included. If you look at all the resources available about the tool, it talks about children, but it seems a bit like an afterthought. So we thought that we, need, we needed a tool that was specifically directed at children's rights instead of being included in a very uh, broad tool where multiple groups have to be, um, the, the impacts of an initiative on multiple groups will be assessed. Um, and so our CREA tool is focusing on the needs of children between the age of zero and 18. And that's because the UNCRC also targets this group. Uh, we also have uh, colleagues at the federal level who are working on a youth impact assessment. And then for, for that tool, it would go all the way to 25 years old and maybe even 30 years old. So, so that young adults would also be included. But in this tool we're presenting today, it's only zero to 18. And so uh, as explained before, it's been primarily, primarily designed to help federal officials identify and consider all potential direct or indirect effects that a proposed law, policy, program, or other initiative can have on children's rights. However, we really wanted to make this tool available to the public. So as uh, Terence and Kate have said, it's available to everyone on the internet so that if organizations, provinces, or other countries are interested, they can use our tool. Um, and of course, as you've understood so far, it's based on the UN Convention on the Rights of the Child. And this is something that is a bit different from other uh, impact assessment tools that we have in government. For, for instance, we have some tools about the environment. Um, we have, you know, we, we have the GBA plus I mentioned, and these tools are not based specifically on an international treaty. So I also think that this makes the CREA different from the other tools that we have, but also extremely interesting from my perspective. Uh, next slide, please. So in a few words, why use a CREA? Uh, because we, we, we can all attest that children are a vulnerable group and that they usually don't have the opportunity to play a significant role in our political processes. They don't have the right to vote, as Terence was saying. They cannot stand for political office. And also whenever we have engagement sessions, it's really hard for them to influence public policy and public debates. Uh, it is true that at the federal government, we usually have obligations to engage with stakeholders whenever we develop initiatives, but engaging with children is difficult. And we know that it's not as accessible for all children to be able to share their, their thoughts. So that's why we think that a CREA, where the goal is to really think about children first, was uh, necessary. Uh, we also want to recognize that children have diverse needs and realities and that officials need to understand the impacts of their initiative on different groups of children. So children are not a monolith. You, we need to consider where children, where, where, where the children come from and the fact that depending on the policy, it might have different impacts on different groups of children. Um, okay, next slide, please. So let's begin our tool. Um, first of all, one thing that we've done is that we've developed a tool in two parts. As you see here on the screen, you have part one, which is the initial screening, and part two, the full CREA. Um, you might wonder why was it necessary to have two parts? So the way that it works is that officials, for instance, or any other person who's interested will start filling out the CREA the part one, question one and two. Um, first question is about the objective of the initiative and 
question too is about the impact of the initiative. And I really agree with what Terrence was saying that most, if not all initiatives can have an impact on children, but we still think that it, it is possible that some initiatives will have very remote impacts so that officials who use the tool will realize after part one, you know what, I don't need to go all the way through the CREA tool. We hope that this will be rare, but for instance, I've personally worked in food law and agricultural law, and there were really cases where if you talk about, I don't know, the importation of bees from the United States, where maybe the impact is extremely remote and you might not need to go through all of it. And it's not to say that it will happen often, but we just want officials to know that we don't want them to do work that they might not need to do. So that's why we have two parts, even though we hope everyone will use the entire tool every time that they decide to use it. So um, the first part, it should, we hope too that the first part will be easy to use for officials because most likely the officials who will be using it are the ones who are leading on a file. So if there's a new regulation that is being developed, we hope that the policy analysts and the councils working on this new regulations will be the one using this tool. So they should know for question one, what is the objective of their initiative? And they should also be able then to look at the impact of the initiative on children. And also you don't see it on the screen here, but for question two, it's not only what are the general impact, we have uh, sub questions. Um, so for instance, we ask, what are the potential impact? And we're looking at positive and negative. Um, also we ask, the officials to think about indirect impact because often it's not that obvious. We have a question B where it says, does it affect different groups of children differently? So this goes back to what I was saying earlier where we want officials to start thinking, you know, does my initiative have an impact on children with disabilities, on children living in poverty or in rural settings? You know, so we have a list of different factors that they might have to consider. And then C, the question is, does it reduce inequalities, exacerbate them, or does it create new ones? And again, it's to really prompt, prompt a bit of a deeper reflection. And at the end of the first part, no matter what the final answer is, you know, are there impacts or not at all, we ask for an explanation of, of the assessment as a kind of a way to conclude the part one. Um, one thing I also forgot to mention is that we really hope that the users will be using the CREA as soon and as early as possible when they develop a new initiative. We all know that if, it, if this is something that you do two weeks before the initiative is launched, no matter what type of initiative it is, it's very unlikely that you're going you're gonna to go back to the drawing board and say, let's revisit our initiative because finally we realize that it has impacts on children, negative ones especially. So our, our goal, and it's a new tool, so of course people will get more and more used to the tool, is that officials will start using it, using it the first day that they start working on an initiative. So that they don't have to use the tool, the entire thing right away, but they can start looking at the questions, you know? And we'll, we'll, I'll be walking you through all, the, all of the questions here, but you'll see that there's something about engagement, about the research that you conduct. So it can also give them ideas on what they should be doing if they really want to make sure that they assess children's rights. Uh, then part two is the full CREA. So as I said, once you finish part one and you see that there are some positive or negative impacts, you move on to part two, the full CREA. Um, we've really tried to make this tool user-friendly. And this is why when you, you look on, uh, on our website, you'll see that question three is a chart. So what we've done is that we've put all of the articles of the UNCRC uh, by category, and then you, there's just one column where it says impacts and you have to say yes or no, so that uh, the users won't be forgetting certain types of rights. And we, we also understand that not every user will be an expert in international human rights law. That would not be possible. So that's why we, we decided to put the list so people don't forget. And also for each article, we have a hyperlink that links to the article of the convention so that can, people can read it and better understand the scope of the right. So that's question three. So it's more of a yes or no for each right. 
Um, then question four, information and research. Um, that's where we ask the users to tell us about the type of research that they've conducted. So for instance, we ask them, have you conducted a qualitative, quantitative research? Have you met with stakeholders? Do you know what their position is? And they might have very, very varied positions. Uh, if it's a legal project, have you looked at the jurisprudence, domestic, internationally? Uh, have you read academic papers on this question? And have you met with experts? Uh, once again, it's very possible that at this point, the user will realize, oh, well, I haven't done any of this. So I'm gonna pause here and I'm gonna go work on my research, my information gathering, and then I'll come back later. Question five is about engagement. So it's about what groups were engaged and also were children consulted. Depending on the initiative, it might be possible and it might not be possible to engage with children directly, but we would hope that they could work with civil society organizations, NGOs, uh, maybe other level of governments to be able to engage with children, um, maybe not directly, but through uh, these organizations. And then question six, would, I would say, is maybe the biggest question of uh, the CREA tool. And this is where you use the work you've done at question three, your preliminary rights review, to dig deeper. So where in the question three you've said, yes, there is an impact, you have to go and explain what the impact is at question six. So you have to explain, is it a positive, a negative, a neutral impact? Um, and to really, you have to explain it a bit more. So this is really the, the core of uh, the CREA analysis. Section uh, question seven is weighing of positive and negative impacts. And this is where you'll see also, you know, if I look at my project as a whole, do I have more negative impacts and positive impacts? And also can I remedy to the negative impacts? Or can I add some positive impacts? You know, is there something to make this project better? And finally, uh, question uh, eight is the conclusion. And I think that the conclusion is really to say, well, is this project ready to move forward or should I go back to the drawing board, work more with my colleagues, stakeholders, you know, other groups to make this project better? And we hope that people will be able to see when a project is not, you know, it doesn't meet the, the expectation for children's rights and will be able to start, not maybe not start from scratch, but work to make it better. And then they can use the CREA tool a second time and they will realize, you know what? What we've done is much better now. So that's our hope. Um, next slide, please. Yeah, so this is an example of what it looks like. Um, actually, that's what it was supposed to look like, but now we have a PDF and an HTML version that is uh, more accessible. But um, here uh, on the left-hand side, Side of your screen, you see the preliminary rights review. So that's the chart I was talking about. So you see, for instance, for guiding principles, you have the four guiding principles and impact, yes or no. And then you see the hyperlink where you can go read the full uh, article to better understand it. And the right hand side, you have the rights analysis. And that's where that's what I was that's when I was telling you it's more of the core of the CREA tool where you really dig deeper and explain what the impacts are for each right. Um, next slide, please. So I will now talk a bit, uh, talk a bit, a, a bit about the course. Um, so as Cassandre mentioned earlier, it took about three years for us to develop the CREA tool and course. I have to say that I think that earlier on, we knew what we wanted the, the tool to look like, but the course took longer, longer than we expected. It's always a, <laughs> a complex project. We had to work with a lot of colleagues from across our department, and we wanted to make it interactive. Uh, we wanted it to be self-paced, of course, bilingual. So finally, it took us longer than we thought, but we're quite pleased with, uh, with the, um, what it looks like now. So uh, again, it's available to everyone, public servants, but also the general public. And it has four modules. And because 
international human rights law is so important. And of course, the UNCRC, we, we needed to start from the beginning. You know, we could not just say, here's the tool, please use it. So that's why we started from the more, more basic, if we know you like more basic information about the international human rights framework. And we move finally to really what our CREA does. Uh, so the first module is the international human rights framework. The second module is about the Convention on the Rights of the Child and Canada's obligation. So for instance, we talk about uh, what we're doing for to implement the convention, the compliance monitoring mechanisms, and some special considerations, for instance, for Indigenous organizations and vulnerable groups. Then the third module is really about CREAS, but more generally not only ours, but what are other countries doing, what are Koreas in general. So we look at key concepts, at the rationale, and again, at some special considerations. And the last module is really about how to conduct a Korea. So it's a bit like what I just explained to you, but in a, in a, in a course version, and there's a step-by-step -step guide to conducting a Korea with our tool. But we also wanted to have two case studies so that people can apply their, their new knowledge. Um, in total, it should take between 2.5 to three hours. Of course, it depends on how fast you are and if you read everything. There's a lot of reading involved. Um, so I think that 2.5 to three hours, if you take your time, that's realistic. Otherwise, well, of course, we know that some people will take an hour to go through it. Um, but because it's free and accessible, you can also come back to it. So you can go through it once maybe quickly, and then once you use the tool, you can totally come back to the parts that you found the most useful to answer some of your questions. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so yeah, our goal was is for users to understand the context behind the CREA, because we don't think that you can really apply it in just a vacuum. And that's why it provides a lot of examples. So we wanted people to understand how, um, in what type of files they can apply it. And again, the fact that it's not because it's not a project about children specifically, it doesn't mean that there won't be any impacts on children. And we mentioned it, we've worked closely with experts uh, within the department, but also outside the department. And for instance, especially for indigenous children, we needed to get uh, the advice of experts to make sure it was accurate. Uh, next slide, please. So I just wanted to give an example, an example of some specific considerations, and I thought that Indigenous children's rights could be interesting. So how did we incorporate this in the tool? Uh, we, we've included specific slides on the role of Indigenous governments in the, the implementation of the CRC. So the way that it works is that in the tool, we don't have one module, for instance, only on children's rights, uh, on indigenous children's rights, but through, through it all, we have added slides to really bring this perspective forward. Um, another example is the slides on the protection afforded to indigenous children within the CRC. So we point out to some key articles from the CRC. Um, we've also included uh, slides on the special attention required in the application of the best interest of the child principle in relation to indigenous children. So we talk, for instance, about the ongoing relationship with family, cultural identity, and language. Um, we've also incorporated some information about Canada's obligation under uh, the UN Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and also the act that Canada adopted after recognizing UN DREP. And finally, we have some concrete examples and initiatives that could have an impact on indigenous children and how a CREA could be applied in those cases. Uh, next slide, please. Um, so I mentioned we had two case studies and we tried to take two examples that were really different from one another. Um, the first one is the Canada Food Guide. And I think that many, many of us know the food guide. We study it in school. I remember as a kid, and it's not something that they do anymore, but we had a little printed version we would put on our fridge. So I thought it was interesting because it's not a guide that is specific. Like it was not made for children only. 
it's really for anyone. But there is definitely a component here that is important for children's rights. So that's why we chose that as an example. We worked closely with Health Canada to make sure it was accurate. And they were really helpful in telling us how they would use a Korea. And it was actually a fun experience for me because after I went through it with them, they told me, oh, well, you're giving us a lot of good ideas for our next review. So, you know, even while we were developing the course, the Korea was being helpful to some teams. Um, and the second one is the remote testimony rules. This is also based off of um, a real program that exists. So children who have to testify before judges uh, often in criminal courts, uh, well, we can all understand how difficult it can be for them. So there is a program where children can testify remotely and have the help of some um, healthcare and mental health specialists. So we also go through that program. Of course, our examples have been a bit, uh, they, they've been tweaked a little bit to just fit better the, the, the learning purpose of, of the course, but I think it can give you an idea of the type of programs we have at the federal level that can benefit from Korea. Uh, next slide, please. This is just a little screenshot of what it looks like. So we've tried to make it interactive. At the bottom of the screen, you can see that there will be narration sometimes, again, French or English. And on the left side, you have the menu where you can really navigate easily. So once you've taken the course, you can go back to it again really easily. You can listen to the slides again and again. So we hope that it's going to be quite user-friendly because for now we don't have uh, a guide to accompany the tool yet. So we really have the tool and the course. So this is kind of the guide at the same time until we we might eventually, which, which is something I would like to have a guide to help people use the tool. Uh, next slide, please. And I've mentioned a bit earlier, the interaction with gender-based analysis plus, just wanted to talk, a bit, talk about it a little more, especially because it will give you an idea on how the CREA can develop in the future. So when gen, the, the GBA plus, as we call it, was first launched, it was not mandatory. So for a couple of years, it was just a tool that uh, public servants could use when they develop new initiatives. But then I think that people realized that it was being very helpful and eventually it was made um, to be mandatory. So that's kind of our hope for the CREA, you know, give a couple of years to people to get used to it and to realize how great it is and then so that it becomes mandatory. So GBA plus is a tool to assess how diverse groups of women, men and gender diverse people may experience policies, programs and initiatives. And the plus acknowledges that there are more, there are intersecting characteristics such as race, ethnicity, religion, age. This is where children would fit in the analysis and mental or physical disability. So you can see that here for in GBA plus, age is in more of an afterthought and it's not the heart of the analysis. Um, so that's why we thought that CREA is actually a good tool to complement and complete the GBA plus analysis. Because now that the GBA plus is mandatory, people have to use it. And it's possible to then, you know, while they come to the CREA, they realize, oh, when I think about age, I realize that the impact is very different on children than it is on the general population. And so this can lead them to CREA. And internally, though that's internal to government, we have a compendium of tools that are useful to conduct the GBA plus. And so we've made sure now that the CREA is there. So that even if some colleagues have not heard about the CREA, by browsing and using the GBA plus, they might discover it and decide to, to use it. Uh, so that's just one of the many ways we're trying to promote it. Uh, and working with the GBA plus team, also they are aware of our initiative, so they can also suggest it whenever they are being consulted. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, so what about the future of CREA? Um, it's still a very young tool, just launched in July, 2023. Uh, as I said earlier, it's voluntary within justice and other departments, but strongly encouraged. Uh, we're trying to promote, promote it as much as possible our, uh, across our networks. 
Um, for instance, one of those networks is the Interdepartmental Working Group on Children's Rights. I've actually seen some members of that group uh, joining the, the call today. Um, so this working group is across the federal government and most departments are represented because almost every single department within the federal government has work that relates to children's rights. Uh, so that's something we've been discussing a lot with this group. And then we've we've asked them, we've asked those departments, well, those key contacts in those departments to become, to promote it with their colleagues. So there's a bit of word of mouth here. Um, yes, I just mentioned the fact that it's been added to the GBA plus compendium internally. And we've also done some promotion on social media for the, the general public. And also whenever we've had some meetings with higher office, high, high officials lately since the spring and even before then, um, often the CREA has been mentioned. For instance, I know that with the uh, UPR coming up, um, that the, there will be a mention or there will be, you know, hopefully that maybe there might even be questions. So whenever we have reviews before international bodies, if it's if there is something to be to be said about it, then we'll we'll push so that our, our tool is being promoted so that people are, are aware of it. Um, next slide, please. Well, that's actually the end. So um, I know that there's already some questions in the chat that were sent to me, but uh, we have quite a bit of time for questions and Cassandra and I can also take questions in French if, if you feel like it. So um, thank you all for listening. Yeah. Thank you to all of the speakers for such an informative presentation. I definitely learned a lot. Um, so yeah, as uh, Jalan mentioned, we will get started with questions. You're, feel free to like put your questions in the chat. I know that some of you have DM'd or direct messaged some folks, so um, we can get to those eventually. Um, but we'll start with a few questions that we already have. And the first one being, this is towards Justice Canada, by the way. Um, so the question is, how does the template help users weigh different impacts and rights after they've been identified when there are a mixture of positive and negative impacts in a specific policy choice? So how can you really just make that decision? Um, I think that's a very good question. So we have our question um, seven and eight about way, weighing it positive and negative and with the conclusion um i don't think that it's like oh you know there's four positive impacts and there's three negative impacts hence it's positive no i think it's more about the bigger picture i think that's the idea be behind this question is to look at all of the impacts that have been identified and and to determine is this enough so that we move forward with this or is there do we really see red flags and a way to make it better and I really don't think it's like it's just a mathematical question. I hope that if some strong negative impacts are being identified that people will realize, well, we have to fix those before we move forward. But I think it's more just, we need also a big picture at the end of this full analysis. That's how I perceive it. Right, that makes sense. Another question. Um... What efforts will be made to promote this course to law and policymakers at all levels of government and students and teachers from K to 12 with whatever adaptations that are needed for younger children? That's a really good question. So for now, we're definitely working on the promotion side. It's a federal tool. So our goal is for federal employees to use it. Uh, mostly policy analysts. So I would say that that's where our efforts are really being, that that's where we target our efforts right now. Um, because we cannot ask provinces to use it. Uh, it's it's not our role. We can, of course, talk to provinces about it. And for instance, two weeks ago, I spoke to the government of Yukon about it and I gave a presentation. Uh, they already have their own tool, but they, they were really interested in what we were doing. So I think that there's that kind of a, softer approach with our counterparts at the provincial, territorial, but even be municipal. So far, I cannot say we've had interest, but you know, if the city of Toronto was interested, I'd be like, yes, of course, I'll <laughs> give you a presentation about it. So I think that when there's a question about students and teachers, that's at the provincial level. Um, 
but of course, if teachers were interested, everything's available online, but to make it mandatory or that would be a provincial initiative. Um, and then at the federal level, I hope I answered about what we're doing so far. I think it's still the beginning. Uh, I have great hope that it might eventually become like the GBA plus and become mandatory. Yeah, that's definitely the goal. Um, mm -hmm. Another question is, uh, it would be useful to flag data sources for compliance with all rights, law, and policymakers that use this tool will need to locate data and will have varying levels of knowledge about where to find it. So is that something that could be built into the existing website? Uh, this looks very ambitious for now. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot make uh, false promises. I don't think that's on a short term, uh, on, on our radar in, in the short term. Um, we actually really, like internally, we work a lot with Statistics Canada. They have amazing data that is usually available to the public. So I think that for everything about data, it's mostly working with StatScan and looking at what they have available. And it's amazing. It's really, you can get lost for days looking at the data. So that's where I think it should be. Uh, that's that's what I would uh, recommend. But it's true that it's a really good idea to maybe link some of the interesting data about children to our website. So I'm taking note of that. And I have to say that we had never thought about that. So all good ideas. Awesome. And the final question that I have um, that we already have available um, would be, Okay, so it's it would be useful to maintain a repository of CRIAs that are conducted to serve as a promotion for their use and a model for methodologies. Are there any plans for this at the federal or other levels of government? Um, so, so far, we've asked people who use the tool to let us know and to share with us um, the result of it. But that's something that's that's more of something that will be shared internally, not externally, especially because the tool is also a working document, so it can evolve a lot. So they, we, I, I, I foresee that we'll see sometimes multiple versions of the tool for one initiative. So for the the moment, nothing public, but internally, we really would like to receive the the completed tools to see how people use it, and also see if we need to tweak it, if we need to add information. You know, do people understand the questions well? So that's something that I think in the next year we'll see more and more, and it will allow us, the CREA team, uh, to, to determine what type of work has to be done to make it better. Great. So we have a few questions in the chat. Um, I know that, Jolan, you received questions yourself uh, via direct message, so maybe you can read that out or send it, and I can read it out loud if you'd like. Yes, let me just scroll through it. Oh yeah, no worries. It's a lot to weed through. <laughs> and I can also ask another question in the meantime. Yes, actually, I've, all the questions that were sent were to everyone, nothing to me personally. So yeah, I'll, I'll just listen to you <laughs> as the questions, if that's okay. Perfect. Um, so we have a question from Christian, and the question says, in New Brunswick, it has been interesting to see CREA methodology move from a policy making tool to its innovative use at times in a case of uh, in case resolution context. Have you given any consideration to this at Justice Canada? Um, I'm not sure to understand what we mean by case resolution context. Um, but do we mean as a way to to you know identify gaps in our policies, maybe? So something more proactive. Um, if that's what what's meant here, I can I cannot really tell you yet how how it's going to be used, right? So I think that for the the time being, it's more when policy analysts start working on in an initiative, then we hope they will be using the tool. Um, in a more general fashion, I don't know how it would be applicable, um, but I really foresee that it will evolve as, as we go. But for the timing, it's more that, you know, you start a new project and we, we hope that people will use it uh, as they work on their project. Great. A question from Kathy. 
will any CREA assessments be made public, for example, along with proposed new bills um, that would encourage its use? Mm -hmm. um, again, not for the moment, because it's not mandatory. Um, but that's something that would be possible. For instance, uh, Justice Canada, for any new bill, has to draft a charter assessment where we, where we look whether or not the bill complies with the rights and freedoms protected by the charter. So I, I, I think that maybe uh, what Kathy has in mind is something similar, where it would be published for any new, uh, any new legislation or regulations. And I think that that would come uh, if it were made mandatory. But that's something we already do in other contexts, so I don't see why not. Great. Question from Nancy. Um, how do the findings of the CREA get rolled up into submissions to Cabinet for consideration? Well, it's all, and I, I mean, I, I know I'm repeating myself, it's all about how, like, whether or not it's mandatory. So right now, no, it doesn't go straight to Cabinet whenever decisions are made. Um, but what the GBA plus it does. So again, if it were to become mandatory, it, it means that it would uh, need to accompany all the other documents that are sent to cabinets. Uh, for now, it's more just of a working tool. So it's at the working level and it's more within each team within government can manage it the way that they want. So I think it will be more about if you have a director general who's really interested in this, and he or she could say, you know what, I realize that you used a tool and that there's a lot of flaws in this project. We should, you know, keep working on it to have a better product. So that's where we're at now. But eventually it could go to cabinet. Um, question from Kathleen. How can CREA users ensure that they address all intersecting rights when looking at the advantages and disadvantages in question six to eight? Uh, how would these users prioritize interests when applying the CREA? Um, that's a good question. I, I don't know if they need to prioritize interests. I think that the goal is to really look at all the factors and to see how they intersect. Um, and that's the thing too, is that sometimes a project, you might be developing a project and you don't realize that it has an impact on children living in rural areas. And because it's in the questions and that's something that we bring back often, you might realize, oh, it's true that these services are just not available for people who live in remote areas. So I don't think it's necessarily to prioritize and trust. It's to see which factors apply and where you have to do more work. Uh, so to me, there's no prioritization and that's what intersection is. It's taking all the relevant factors and seeing how they interact together. Awesome. And I believe this is the final question um, content wise from the audience. And uh, it's from Bronwyn who asked, could Justice Canada please talk about how they view the degree to which a certain understanding of the CRC is necessary to complete a CREA? Um, well, because the CRC is behind the tool and it's really the, the foundation behind the tool, I think it's good for people to familiarize themselves with the UN CRC. Um, and this is why the, the, the course really talks about, about the CRC quite at length. Um, and I think that people can, of course, go read it. Uh, but there's so much more also that's available online that we also link in the course. So the general comments, for instance, of the UN, the UN Committee on the Rights of the Child, uh, I think allows us to better understand the scope of certain rights. So um, depending on people's interest, we hope that you know they will use all of those hyperlinks we've put in the in the course to 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 dig a bit deeper. And I also think that when uh, people start using the tool, they might realize, oh, well, you know what, this right, I don't really understand what it means. And then they can go on the, the, the main web page of the UNCRC and the committee and see what they've written about this. So it's true that it might require some research sometimes to fully understand the scope of a right. Uh, and we hope that the, um, the course, course will be a really good first step for people to understand, uh, to better understand the convention. Awesome, thanks so much. Um... Jolan, I'll give you a break for all the questions. <laughs> uh, we have one that's directed at either Kate or Terrence, uh, but thank you so much for your detailed responses. Uh, so 
question for Kate and Terrence. How can the federal government build off of this? What are some of the next steps that you would like to see with the CREA? I guess I can uh, start. So I think some of the questions that we've been hearing from the audience, um, I think they really point to what the next steps might be, in particular uh, efforts to promote this tool across not only all levels of government, but uh, across all levels of society. I think there's tremendous opportunity to integrate this training program into um, professional education, for example, law schools, uh, public administration programs, but also professional training, in-house professional training at the federal government, for example, onboarding in certain departments. Uh, we would love to see that sort of thing. Um, more broadly, though, we talked about CREA being one of a set of tools. And so uh, our hope is that with the CREA template and the training um, established, it will uh, highlight the need for more work in some of the other areas of implementation of the convention. So for example, there was the question uh, from Kathleen, I think about what, what do you mean by a certain understanding of the CRC? We, we know from UNICEF's comparative uh, research that uh, Canadian adults have one of the lowest uh, awarenesses, uh, lowest awareness of the convention compared to other uh, peer countries. And so integrating some uh, public education and awareness about children's rights in general, I think would support the, the adoption of this CREA tool and vice versa. The use of CREA will also uh, in, you know, normalize discussion of children's rights in certain uh, policymaking spaces, which will be beneficial to, to people's awareness. Um, also things like the, you know, the CREA template uh, encourages the engagement of children and young people, but the federal government, as we've seen in the past, doesn't have standing mechanisms to do that. Uh, so when you, when if you are a public servant and you're conducting a CREA and you get to the component where it's asking you to engage children, there's 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 not a lot of options available to you outside of reaching out to civil society organizations uh, like UNICEF, like CCRC, and that's you know that's uh, we've been happy to play that role in the past, but ideally we would like to see the gov uh, federal government creating those mechanisms, creating those structures so that when somebody's conducting a CREA, they get to that component and they have a support system, uh, professionals who know how to engage children uh, safely and appropriately and meaningfully, uh, and they're able to draw on that expertise in order to, to create a more wholesome CREA. So those are a couple areas where we think that this fantastic foundation could be could be built on. Any thoughts, Kate? Thanks, Terrence. Yeah, I mean, I think I think you covered a lot of the main points, I guess, just just to add to that is, you know, one of the things we always talk about is having sort of more conversations with young people about the realization of their rights and opportunities and spaces for them to realize Article 12 of the convention, um, sort of this ability to have their opinions heard. So I guess one of the, the things that we're excited about is that, as Terrence say, says, this will really normalize and mainstream and you know, to some degree formalize uh, these, hopefully these relationships and these opportunities for young people to have input into policy decisions, both at the federal level and potentially also at other levels of government. Thanks so much for your responses, Kate and Terrence. Um, and I would like to open the floor again, just to the audience, if you have any more questions, you can also uh, unmute yourself if you'd like after raising your hand. Um, but yeah, I just want to give you another opportunity to ask any questions that you may have. I believe Chris has a question. Sorry, I was trying to maybe unmute him. Chris, is it okay if we just unmute you and you can ask it, Chris Whalen? Yeah. Um, well, my, my question was really just about what have been some of the successes that uh, that uh, surprised uh, Jolene or the or the team at Justice Canada throughout this process. I, I was specifically asking about uh, you know whether there have been 
some encouraging examples in the tools early adoption that stood out to you, either people making really good use of data mobilization or people actually making good use of the general comments. Uh, we've, uh, I, I, I think that's the challenge that we've seen in New Brunswick is, you know, moving past this kind of perfunctory analysis. Well, okay, well, you know, I have to do this CREA, so here's my best stab at the CREA to, you know, a really kind of demonstrative application of child's rights in practice, right, through uh, sort of applying the general comments to and the advice there to the policy choices that uh, that you're considering. And uh, so I'm 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 kind of hopeful that at the federal level, people will have more time and uh, and and more training, you know, to be able to engage with that. I'm just wondering what your sense of that is. Thank you very much, Christian. Um, that's a, a good question. I think it's too early to tell for now. It was launched in mid July, and as you know, July and August things are slow. So I feel like we're just really starting to see people use it. We've given a bunch of presentation in September and now in October. So I cannot tell you how it's been used so far. Um, one thing that we've done, for instance, is that in my team, our role, uh, we're the human rights experts uh, at Justice Canada. So we advise other lawyers whenever they have human rights questions, either internationally or nationally. So we've already asked our colleagues to be kind of the promoter of the tool. So whenever they have a questions where they realize the CREA would be useful to tell you know, their clients, hey, do you know this exists? Would you like to, to use it? We can help you use it. So just small initiatives like this, where I hope that, you know, eventually we'll see more and more people use it. And then once we have a couple of um, finished careers, we'll be able to see uh, if, for instance, the general comments are being used and what people understand of the tool. Um, so, but I think we'll need a couple of extra months before we can start uh, uh, having a better understanding of how uh, it's being used. Awesome, thanks so much. Um, and we have another question in the chat from Bronwyn. And the question is, is Justice Canada tracking the use of the CREA to see its impacts and maybe identify ways to support its use? Um, yes, so, well, yes and no. So we've asked, especially within our in, uh, the uh, inter uh, working group, that people report to us when they are they are using the CREA. So it's nothing official, but we really ask our close collaborators, please tell us when your department or your colleagues, your team, uh, uh, when they are using the tool. So that's kind of our tracking system for now. It's it's the beginning, um, but definitely the goal would be to like you know if we see problems with it, if we see that some questions are misunderstood, there's something missing. We're not uh, against, you know, amending it. And same thing for the, the the training as well. If we realize there's missing information, we're totally uh, open to making changes maybe in a year or so uh, if it's necessary. And then for ways to support it, um, so far, really, justice is the lead, but I have to admit that, you know, we're a couple of people only who've been using, who've been working on the CREA and it's one project among so many other ones. So there, it's a heavy burden on our shoulders. We're doing our best. And again, it's, you know, the more it's being used, the more we can explain why we need more resources to help us manage the tool. And I know I keep saying that it's the beginning, but that's really what it is. And I am sure you understand that that's how it works. Uh, you have to launch something, you have to show that it's relevant and that it's useful before you have more resources. I would just uh, jump in there, Jolin, to say to the folks on the calls, I mean, everybody who's interested in this tool, the the one small thing that we can all do to advance this is to, to take this training program and show uh, Jolin and Kassam's colleagues across the federal government that there's interest in this type of thing, that civil society is paying attention to the work that the government is doing in this area. Um, so I would I would strongly encourage everybody to uh, take a look and of course uh, provide feedback on the the training program. Definitely, and that's something that we can track. 
So from our website, we know how many people have taken the course internally and externally. So of course, if we see that we have thousands of interested people, that will help us in the future too. Um, yeah, we definitely hear you. I think that usage is so necessary um, to really establish this, this tool as an important one, one that we can perhaps make mandatory. So that's definitely the goal. Um, well, we don't have any more questions. Um, so I think that's all for today. Thank you everyone for coming. I know how difficult it can be to carve time out of your day. Um, I know that we may have, you know, work responsibilities or, you know, children or jobs or whatever. And so um, we really appreciate you taking the time and, you know, learning and advancing the rights of children in your own way. And so uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, email the CCRC and I've pasted our email in the chat. Um, and we can forward them to Jolan or Cassandre and, um, and just have them answered eventually. Yeah. And as Kate mentioned, you can join us for more webinars in the fall. <laughs> we have a lot coming up. Um, but yeah, if, if, that's, if you don't have any more questions, feel free to have a great day. <laughs>